So I'm, I'm zooming out to the author of the book, Campaigning for Clean Air, Meredith Angwin. And she came with her husband, who's also has helped her co-author some of that and other things. Um, uh, what can you tell us, Meredith, about the conference and about your book? Well, let's start with the conference. I was really delighted to be here. And one of the reasons is that it's really upbeat. Uh, it's really about the new reactors and, 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 uh, and everybody has their, their plans and, and their testing going on. And even though there's a very non-upbeat part, which is that most of it is going to happen in other countries, even with American ideas, um, it was still great to see the future being discussed. Uh, and the other thing was that there was so much about advocacy. Uh, and I, I consider that so important. Um, and also that people are doing local advocacy, starting groups in their own towns. And uh, Back when I started being an advocate for Vermont Yankee, there was the feeling that the nuclear industry had uh, lobbyists uh, uh, in Washington and that was all it needed. Uh, you know, they really, uh, there, there was no idea that they needed local advocates doing anything. I really liked both aspects of the conference. It was just so upbeat and cheerful and uh, there was so much about advocacy. Well, my this book is Campaigning for Clean Air, Strategies for Pro-Nuclear Advocacy. And my target audience is people who have, for whatever reason, they've read other books or they work in the industry or whatever, they're already convinced that nuclear is an important part of our future energy mix. Uh, the book has some sections called white papers about the positive aspects of nuclear, but it's not trying to compete with all the books such as, um, uh, you know, uh, um, Power to Save the World and uh, the, bit, the um, Radiation and Reason and, and other books that are very important about uh, Another one is Climate Gamble. I, I could keep naming them, but these are all books that show you why nuclear is really necessary for the future of our world. My book isn't complete, compete with those because a lot of those books end sort of the same way. Now that you know, go out and be in favor of nuclear, and people don't know how to do that. They are not getting out and being in favor of any anything particular in general. Their lives are not about uh, being advocates for this followed by being advocates for that. I mean, uh, some people uh, actually have advocacy as an important part of our, their lives. Most nuclear supporters, uh, it's, it's the first time to do something like this. And so my book is sort of like the what then book. When you finished the book which explains why you have to be supporting nuclear, then this is the book that will help you do that. Now if you had handed that book out and you had written it 10 years ago, do you think Vermont Yankee might be in a different situation right now? Well, I'd like to think so, but I, I, I think that we could have been more proactive in early days when it was still more possible to be proactive. By the time I got involved, um, the person who was running for governor of Vermont was running basically on the basis that he was going to shut Vermont Yankee down and that his rival was, quote, care more about energy shareholders than the people of Vermont. So you should vote for me because I care about the people of Vermont. It was really pretty bad. But it didn't have to get to that point. I think that if there had been enough people being pro-nuclear earlier, maybe he wouldn't have found that quite as uh, uh, appealing. Uh, on the other hand, Vermont has three political parties. Um, and. Uh, basically the, the um, maybe eight, I don't know how many, but there are Republicans, Democrats, and progressives. And uh, the, gov the person, was, Shumlin, was r running as a, a Democrat, and he'd always won his races, except one time when the progressives ran a candidate against him, he lost. So he was gonna be very careful that whatever the progressive line was, he was towing it, because he, he didn't want them running a candidate against him.
Well, yes, they're very, they are very different, and every state, uh, there's two big differences, uh, though really both California and Vermont are in uh, independent system operator areas, uh, as opposed to regulated, uh, regulated areas. They consider that independent system operators are somewhat deregulated, uh, a bidding process to see what plants are run, while regulated areas, the regulators decide uh, what plants can be built and run. Um, I would say that the, uh, even, even though that they're both in what's called deregulated areas, the rules that the regulators impose are quite different. And also states can put their own rules on top of the regulators' rules. So it gets to be very, very complicated. And uh, I have been learning about this for, I would say, maybe five years. I've been interested in it. Um, and, uh, and in the past four years, I've been a member of the coordinating committee for the consumer liaison group of the grid operator, which has only 12 members, and, uh, and it's supposed to be the consumer's voice for the grid operator. So I mean, I've been really as involved as I can be, and I still keep learning things all the time, things that surprise me, things that just seem backwards. And uh, I would say that one of the things is that anti-nuclear groups have been very active on these committees for a long time. I would say that it's an important source of, of uh, low carbon, non-polluting non energy that 60% of, of the clean air energy in this country is nuclear. That they, the thing is that nuclear is so small they don't notice it. That, that there's, um, you can drive by all these dams, right? I mean, the Colorado, the Columbia, the Tennessee Valley Authority, dams all over the place, hydro plants, huge hydro plants. And they make one third of the energy that the nuclear plants make. And, and, and yet you don't even see the nuclear plants. So if you want a future with a lot of clean air, non-combustion energy, you really have to have a future that includes nuclear. If we were to replace nuclear with, say, hydro, we'd have to have three times the dams we have now and three times as many. We don't have enough rivers for that. You're a mother of two children, right? Yes, and, and two grandchildren. I'm not a mother of a grandchildren, grandmother of a grandchildren. And when you think about our futures, you think about what kind of world they're going to grow up into, right? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. I want them to have a world of abundance and a clean, uh, a clean environment. And when I think about a clean environment, you have to understand I grew up in Chicago at a time when everybody burned coal in their, in their boilers in their basements. So, I mean, I know what a dirty environment is like. It's not a theoretical thought to me. And Chicago is far enough north that if, um, if we did have uh, a predominantly re renewable energy uh, sources and we had a cold spell, um, it could be frightening. Oh yeah, absolutely. It gets very cold there. Yeah. And, 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 and it also has a wind chill factor, which I noticed every day that I was going to school. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks, thanks very much, Meredith. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at other conferences and maybe uh, get, get this up on YouTube. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.